this is Everyday Expertise, and I'm Angela, and I'm here today with Daniel Mark Miller. He's a senior digital compositor and filmmaker with more than 10 years' experience across film, TV, and advertising. He's worked on films and TV shows like Baby Driver, Good Omens, and more. Welcome. Hi. So first, let's define some things here. What is digital compositing? Okay, so um, compositing actually predates the digital bit. So compositing means when you have more than one image and you need to stick them together. So people are more familiar with like photo montage and Photoshop. But in film, you've had that sort of thing, you know, since the beginning. So if you think of Wizard of Oz, she's walking along the Yellow Brick Road and she's filmed. And there's the City of Oz in the background that I think was painted on glass and actually kind of in front of the camera. Um, or um, there are other ways that it might have been done. Optically, Star Wars, you had, obviously, in the original, you had models and people um, that were filmed separately at different times, and they were stuck together, so they all looked like a seamless image. Again, you still had sometimes the paintings that were just like that. Um, in some scenes, Millennium Falcon was literally a painting on uh, behind them. So you, in the digital world, um, we're doing the same sort of job digitally, and the objective is to make it look like it was filmed with the same camera. So if one thing is CGI or one thing is a model or both, and another thing is some actors that were shot on a plate, or maybe there was an explosion that was filmed somewhere else so that the actors don't get blown up, um, then we stick them together and it should all look like it was filmed in the same camera. That's pretty cool. So how did you get started with that? So I started actually doing my own kind of films. Um, so I did a general media degree, which um, generally doesn't give you um, the skills to actually get be useful in the industry initially, although it becomes more useful later if, you're, if you do manage to get in somehow. Um, and I, so I would do these kind of entry level jobs. In, in the UK, you have something called a runner, which is basically like make tea and coffee um, for slightly less than minimum wage. And you, you know, you are kind of a skivvy, basically, um, and you would try and help out. And, of course, you do a bit of those sort of entry-level jobs, and if you don't have some kind of um, a lot of money, money behind you, you would probably have to do other jobs to kind of get by. So I would sort of bounce between doing a bit of these sort of entry-level jobs or indie films that don't pay and actual jobs um, that did pay but that weren't connected to the industry. Um, I ended up teaching English as a foreign language in, in Italy, which gave me a lot more free time so I could do some short films of my own. And when you do short films, you 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 get to know what you're good at and, and what you enjoy because you're doing all jobs often. Um, and so I found that I really liked editing and I really liked doing um, effects. And I got really, really into effects on the last film that I did, which was like 2005, which is crazy. But um, And it was just in, in After Effects, which is quite a common piece of software. But it's not what we use mostly in the industry for compositing. And I got really into that. I did an online course with something called FX PhD, which is still going. Um, and that was great. You would subscribe and you would have sort of industry professionals recording um, how they work with the software and you get to find out how the industry worked and what the software was, which was um, at the time Shake. Shake is now defunct, but there's a software called Nuke, which everyone uses, and, and that's what I'm using. Um, came back to London and I've been doing it ever since. Started with small things like little, um, uh, there's a TV channel called Sky and they do um, Sky Sports, like they do the football, when I mean football, you know, like kicking the ball, not American football. And um, so you'd have like these little graphics of the players kind of, they'd be shot on green screen, um, which would be fun when they were wearing green. But, um, <laughs> and then you would turn them into little graphics and, and gradually get to do more interesting things, you know. And I did a bit in advertising, which is quite different because advertising, you do lots of stuff very quickly and you get a good variety of work. I just touched my face, which we shouldn't do. And then um, in, in film, you generally start with the most basic job is something called roto which is like if you don't have a green screen you need to cut people out by hand like mm -hmm. draw around them kind of thing and trace them uh, in movement and make it not look flickery um, and then when you've done that a while you kind of move up to what's called paint or prep or clean up depending on who you ask and that's literally you know the boom comes in shot you paint it out or somebody wanders into frame and you paint them out and it, those shots can actually those shots can actually get harder than, than some of the, the more senior shots. It's just that the more senior shots are cooler. So, um, so we do a lot of that kind of work. Um, and then 
worked for a TV um, company and was doing lots of all kinds of things, lots of squibs, like blood coming out of people when they've been shot and uh, screens and um, all kinds of things, really. So I've been moving on from there. Mm. Do you have any, I guess, uh, so it, might, it might be a weird question, uh, influences in your work? Anybody you looked, any, anyone else that you you sort of, you go, they do great work? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's some people, I mean, like my, my old boss, uh, Dolores, she was uh, really cool. She's really fast and um, quite different from a lot of the ways I was taught um, uh, in some ways because she was kind of old school. She was like one of the first people using uh, flame in, in Ireland. And so she, she had a very particular way of working. Um, and often with bid times that were a lot less than, than most people would bid you to do the same work. So I, when you start thinking about how she'll do it, you can often find a, a quick way of doing it, which is not always the best for all film work, uh, but it sometimes is good to get, it's always good to get a quick version out, even if you're going to go back and, and refine it later. So um, that's that's one. Um, there are a few other sort of um, the bigger sort of supervisors um, that are kind of famous. I mean, all those kind of making of Star Wars movies that I, I that I watched in the 80s when I was a kid, um, a lot of those kind of very old school techniques, adoptable techniques, you can recreate digitally. So that sort of stuff, um, like Trumbull and those kind of supervisors were, you know, they're, they're really important. So it's a bit of a mix. It's the people that you actually work with and there's people that you kind of know a bit of the mm-hmm. same, a different. So, yeah. That's cool. So this show is very much about process. Uh, can you walk me through a typical project, say, from when you start to be involved to the end, to the end of your, your work? Okay. So my uh, role will start once they've completed the edit. The edit is kind of locked. It shouldn't change. It may change, but it shouldn't really. Um, and they will have then assign the individual shots so they'll actually chop it up and they'll send out send me a number of shots um they'll be sent and some of them will be sent to the company that i'm working for some of them might if it's a big show some of them might be sent to other companies as well and some of them may have other tasks assigned to them so some of them may need um stuff painted out they may need matte paintings so people to paint you know backgrounds in photoshop they might need 3d stuff 3d creatures or explosions or whatever and then I will get my shot I will usually get everything that is used for that shot so I will have the plate as in the footage I will have the um, CG if there is any the matte painting and so on and the cleanup and all of that so then I load that into Nuke the software and I know what I've got to do because I've got a um, project management software running which will be either shotgun or f track there are a few others but those are the two main ones um so i'll load my shot um elements in and i'll load it into nuke and i'll check all my elements that they're all kind of good to go and then i'll usually put together what's called a slap comp so just a kind of first sort of bash at it it may be that if the brief is complicated i want to show someone immediately the slap comp and then get some sort of sign off on that before doing it sort of um to a higher level. If it's a fairly straightforward task, then I will just get on with it and do it to um, final. We'll show that um, in a daily within a sort of mini cinema. Um, you'll get notes from the supervisor, possibly the other artists there will be there and depending on the nature of the facility, they may be able to have their thoughts on the shot as well. And you'll then address those notes, do that. That gets, If that's good enough within the facility internally, it'll be sent out to the client. They'll review it. If they like it, um, then we're good to go. And we'll do what's called tech check, which means just check, you know, the edges and, and grain, that it matches the grain that was filmed in camera and all these sort of little fine things that you might not notice on the run, but it definitely, if you play the shot multiple times, you'll, you'll see. Um, and then when we've done that, um, I'll just move on to another shot. If the shot has to wait for other stuff, then it might be that I'll do a little bit on a shot, park it, work on another shot, park that, work on another shot. So it won't often be that you'll just be sitting on one shot working all the way through. You'll bounce back and forth between a couple of shots or a few shots. 
And then basically, I, I guess you render and then you deliver or something. Do you have? To, I don't know. So yeah, so we we stuff. yeah, so render render time is is actually a factor. So in compositing, it's relatively fast. It's a bit like mm. editing. You're kind of splicing stuff together. When although on a big comp with lots and lots of elements, uh, very high resolutions, that can actually still become a significant amount of time. It's definitely more time than you would want to render on one computer. So we normally have like a render farm, as in like a, a server room full of computers mm. that will all render um, each frame. For 3D, render time is super, super expensive. So render, you know, renders could take like 10, 12 hours a frame. Mm. So then even when you've got a lot of computers, it's significant. You have to actually kind of project manage that. So you go, okay, we're going to render this, this water splash over the weekend. We're going to have your task with what you have, uh, um, show a whip, show that everyone likes it, and then we get the full res render on, on Monday. So mm. um, in terms of our renders, we do a render for each of the film. We render um, that they put in the, that the client can put in the edit and they can check that it, it works in the edit. Because obviously you'll get notes on the shot itself does the shot itself look good? But also, when it's put in the edit, when it's put in the story, does it actually match? You could do something that looks amazing, but if it doesn't match the shot before and the shot after, then that's problematic. So there's a lot of back and forth. You'll render several versions, um, you know, and and it will go back and forth. So there'll be creative changes, and then eventually you'll get to tech check, where it's just a matter of, is it all technically correct? Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. So, uh, what's something you wish you'd known about digital compositing before you began? Uh, I think I wish I'd known that it existed before it, <laughs> before I began, because um, it wasn't entirely clear. Like when I left, for example, when I left uh, my media studies course, um, I'd done filming and editing, but it wasn't mentioned as a potential career. I mean, it was pretty new. I mean, I've got, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm 43. I finished university in like 1999. It existed. There were flames and shakes doing stuff on big films and on high end commercials, but it wasn't like super well known. And even now, 20 years later, when everyone should know, you'd be surprised how many people don't actually know what we do. And it's it's a it's a bizarre thing with the industry how few people know what you know what our entire section of the industry actually does. Yeah, I wish I'd known that it existed um, in that form at the time because I could have probably got moving a lot earlier, maybe 10 years earlier. <laughs> that would be like um, a real but, ground uh, floor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's kind of, you know, that's that's probably the main thing, I would say, that, it, that I knew that it existed. And I'm hoping that any of your audience that don't know that it exists, now you know there's a whole, there's a whole career out there that mm. maybe you've not heard of. Yeah, I imagine it's a, it's a lot like that in, in a lot of creative things, right? You just don't, you go to school and you don't really learn about the individual jobs. You really just get like, everyone wants to be a director. And it's like, well, yeah, there's lots of stuff you can do otherwise, you know? Yeah, and I think that's the thing about the film industry is like people, of course, there aren't many directors, there aren't many DOPs or even like, film editors but there are a lot of people working on films right i mean you know not just i mean in post-production there are compositors prep artists clean artists road artists match movers 3d modelers fx artists and pipeline people you know there are lots and lots of people doing stuff and that's just post i mean on set mm. even electricians and carpenters you know and people that paint the set uh props people animal wranglers you know all kinds of stuff so caterers so, you know, if you say you want to work in film, it's not that unattainable if you're actually just like you want to do, if, you, if you're including these below the line roles. And below mm -hmm. the line is like we paid a fee and then you're done. Yeah. Like you get paid a wage and then you're done. So above the line is like a director or producer, they, they get percentages as well. So if the mm -hmm. film makes more money, they get more money. Whereas yeah. we just get paid. Fine. Um, which is great if the film flops, obviously, you still get paid. Of course, that's true. <laughs> but, you get paid first. But if, the film, yeah. if the film does well, you kind of, you know, you kind of like to get a bit of that action yeah. too. <laughs> so that's, that's um, yeah, yeah, I think that's the main thing. 
So how do you uh, how do you maintain work life balance? Uh, that is tricky. I mean, that's kind of about choosing the kind of companies you work for um, and the kind of um, shows you work for. So it can be a nightmare in, um, especially on some of the big, big, big films and certain uh, of the bigger companies where you know people are working late every night, they're working weekends. Um, if your other companies will maintain more of a balance, so we do have a kind of crunch time. The end of a project, you're going to be working late, you're going to be working long hours. Uh, you might work some weekends, but. As long as you're not going crunch to crunch to crunch, and as long as when you finish that show, you go on something, and at the beginning it ramps up slowly, and so it's a lot more chilled, then I think you can find that balance. Um, and I think if it's more you know, more rhythmical like that, that you kind of have a slow a slow sort of build up, um, which means you can take your full lunch break and kind of leave on time and roll in at a normal sort of decent hour, maybe even sometimes leave a little bit earlier but on the other day you know but you know that when it ramps up you're going to work you know these long hours then that's okay i mean i've been places where you would work all night and and come in the next morning you might leave at three in the morning and be told off for coming in late the next day when you're like 15 minutes late so, but <laughs> i got home at 4 a.m you know working not like going to the club um and you know, I, at one point I even did like 37 hours straight in one place, which I was supposed to be doing. So it was it was kind of pointless. Of course, if you have kids, if you have family, you they, they will take priority because the reality of the creative thing is you think that's the most important thing in the world. But when you have you know a family, you realize that they are ultimately more important than than any movie or whatever. So they force you to take that control a little bit. It's true. And now I have like uh, coronavirus, which is forcing us to readdress things in a totally different way. Um, now it's like, you know, I mean, things that were impossible, for example, working from home wasn't usually considered an option for any of the bigger films because um, of the um, NDA, the sort of uh, copyright issues. Essentially. Yeah. Uh, now we're all finding ways to remote access our computers and, and work from home. Obviously, you know, you have to be careful. You can't even let your partner come in the room while you're working mm. and stuff. So there's all this kind of stuff. And if you're sharing a flat, it's obviously a lot more tricky than if I mean, I'm living in quite a big house, so I'm kind of it's kind of easy. But um, you know, that's that's also forced us to think of things completely new ways. And I don't know whether that will remain after this is all kind of died down. And you know, people might have a longer commute. People might say, I want to live further from where the office is, come in three days a week, and maybe it's a two-hour commute, but if you're doing it three days a week, it's not so bad, and then two days you work from home, or two days you come in, three days you work from home, you know, then it, it, it means a lot of things, right? I mean, the obvious one is you, you can easily live further away from the office because that two-hour, three-hour commute is no longer an issue. It's only a couple of days a week. Um, who knows? Who knows what the long-term sort of thoughts are for the yeah. long term so, so are they just going to say no we, we, that was a that was an emergency measure we're shutting it down now it's, i don't know yeah. it's a changing world it is mm. so um do you have a favorite aspect of your work um well i like i like to you see the Two different things. There's kind of this problem-solving technical aspect and there's creative aspect. And I enjoy them both. Um, I find I like to, I need to balance between them. And the reason for that is because creativity, uh, creativity is great when you are the final arbitrator of text. When you're in a service, uh, like composing as a service, or then anything creative, is ultimately subjective and you're not the one making the final decision. So it can be more fun initially, but it can also be more heartbreaking because you could do everything right and the client doesn't like it and they change it. They could change it in a way that you don't even like anymore. Um, so it could go from being this, this favorite thing to being your most hated thing. Mm -hmm. So I do find that I can't say which is my favorite because I like to have jobs that are objective. You know, it's, it's a technical thing. There's a right answer. And you just do it and it's done. And you do it right and it's done. 
Um, but I like to have that opportunity to be creative as well. I just can't do it all the time because I find, you know, you would get worn down when, you know, you're not always getting what you want through. Um, mm. I mean, sometimes you do. I mean, not being, you know, you do get to do something creative and they love it and it goes through and that's amazing. But the reality is that's like one time in four, maybe. So, you know, other times there's always going to be someone who's going to change it. And films, the bigger they are or advertising, they have lots of people who need to like it. Like, and it will go up the chain and it could be that the, the director loves it, the creative loves it, and then it will get, and then an executive won't like it and then, then you have to do it again. So, mm. you know. So is there, a, uh, do you have a least favorite aspect, anything that frustrates you? Um, I, I find that, you know, sometimes the actual, tech itself can become frustrating when you're pushing the computer to a point where it just doesn't want to operate. It, it, you have trouble playing back the footage that you're working on um, because the resolutions are often been getting higher. So you get a computer that could handle HD easily and then it would move up to 2K and then it would move up to 4K and then you get stuff at 6K and then you're sort of juddering it from time to play back. Um, you can't always watch the thing in context. So that would be be the most frustrating aspect. Um, now you obviously try and work around that, and that's problem solving, which is something that I enjoy. So finding those kind of ways to get around them can be a lot of fun. But when you don't have a way around and you just have to kind of bludgeon through it, then that's not fun. Mm. Okay. Do you have any advice for people starting out in uh, in digital compositing in VFX work? Um. In general, I would say um, pay attention to what you're doing and what other people are doing. Um, check your mistakes. It's going to be the, the schoolboy errors that are going to hold you back rather than like the really epic sort of things that you can do. It's just getting the, the basic things right. Um, and with compositing in particular, there's a clear path that you do roto, which is cutting people out, with masks that are animated and then paint, paint things out um, and then you do comp. So a lot of um, people do their first show reel, which is the show reel is what gets you work. Like it's, it's a video example of what you can do. The first show reel is going to be a one-off, like it's your student work or it's your own projects. And then hopefully the next ones are going to have your professional work in it, which is what you've got your first job. But a lot of the time people will go for that kind of epic um, compositing shot um, which is great, but you know that's not going to be the first job. So the first job is going to be doing roto and paint out. So do really good roto and really good paint work. And that will teach you some of the skills that you'll need later on anyway. Um, that doesn't mean don't you know try those other things, but but just bear in mind that you need to make sure that you have the task for the job you're applying to. Um, and don't just think about the big studio. Because the big studios um, uh, big factories, it's much harder to move up and down to do different kinds of tasks, to move across and do bits of 3D or do other things. Some of the small studios, they might not be a 3D department. If they need to be in 3D, you might get to do it. Um, and so if you are interested in doing lots of different things, look at the smaller studios. Uh, think about post houses where you know they, they're not necessarily the effects places, but they're places that do editing or color grading. Um, and they also have some VFX capacity. You know, think of those places as well. Think of a wider range of work and think about advertising as another different kind of um, market. So think about all the kinds of things that you could do um, and try, try different things because you never know. Hmm. That's cool. So um, how can people find out more about you and your work? Uh, I have a website, which is uh, danielmarkmiller.uk, and that's Mark K, um, in the UK. <laughs> I have a LinkedIn, I have an Instagram, which is called A Real Little Mind, and I have a Vimeo, which is uh, vimeo.com slash danielmarkmiller, and I'm on ITV. So I'm kind of all over the place um, in terms of the interwebs and stuff. So, and we'll have links to descriptions of, in the description to as many of these things as we can. Okay, that's cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, and I've got a short film called Broken Toy, which has a website as well, Broken 
www.uk. So uh, what we're doing at the moment is I'm getting people to sign up for like a, a mailing list to find out updates of what we're doing. Um, not sure when we're going to be filming now because filming is uh, problematic. Uh, the problem means we're going to do a lot more of the previous stuff um, that we've been working on. But we're at the stage of applying funding, so the more people are following the project, the more that helps us to actually make it make it happen when you know we can go out. Yeah, and <laughs> that's true. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you, everybody, for watching. This has been Everyday Expertise. All right, thank you. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this interview. Be sure to share this video with friends and colleagues who may also enjoy this topic. Let us know your thoughts by leaving a comment below or check the description for our social media. See you next time.